we will now begin our inauguration ceremony. 我哋而家開始履新儀式，有請香港中文大學文學院文化及宗教系系主任譚偉倫教授為大家致辭。係好歡迎大家誒、呃、參加今晚我哋呢個非常簡單，但係咧意義好深遠，亦都好隆重嘅一個呢個簡單嘅儀式。咁啊，好開心啦！十四年前，我哋喺香港中文大學咧就成立咗個天主教研究中心。咁啊，唔經唔覺，時間真係過得好快。咁你我哋好感恩啦，即係誒雖然今日好似見唔到啊夏其龍神父，咁佢我哋佢幫咗我哋咧，即係十幾年喺呢度。咁啊誒，其實今日阿 Mary 有嚟噶啊，阮美儀呢個係幫咗我哋好大忙。誒、呃，咁我哋要多謝咧，仲有三位以前啊，我哋天家研究中心嘅副主任啦，啊啊譚永亮神父啦，同我同姓噶，不過咧就係啱。<笑>咁<笑>啊，喺喺會唱嗰邊嘅，我係開屏嗰邊嘅，咁啊就就大個性係一樣咁嚇，咁啊仲有咧就係啊誒關敬堂神父啦，同埋咧蔡文神父，咁佢哋三位嘅副主任，咁佢哋咧就為中心咧就誒誒即係建建立咗一個好好強嘅一個基礎，咁啊、呃、有兩位人士我係誒即係唔會忘記嘅，一個就係 Sister Lebon。咁佢係聖母無言罪誒收會嘅一個誒，佢兩位都係我老師。咁佢哋喺七十年代開始已經喺中文大學任教，所以我成日要要用一句詞就話我哋嘅 Catholic presence 喺七十年代開始。咁佢係教我哋點樣喺中學教天主教。咁咪知道我哋天主教學都有，其實好多係誒基督宗教嘅誒學校咧，而家資深嘅老師咧都係佢嘅。誒弟子嚟啊，咁啊，所以影響相當大。咁而家佢已經係誒、呃，就唔喺誒，唔喺曬上啦。咁另外啲誒誒特別紀念嘅就係 Father Shield，Father Shield 就係思維純神父，咁亦都係一個耶穌會嘅神父。咁佢喺度教 Catholic Dogmatics。咁誒、呃，我好多嘢都當時都請教佢啦，包括就係話誒，我哋嘅神學院如果有聖餐，我應唔應該參加咧？咁。<笑>神話冇去，<笑>我記住嗰個説話。咁所以誒，時時係一個好一個老師，亦都係神長。我誒時時都誒記住佢哋兩位。咁我哋誒今日好開心啦。誒，因為年紀大就都都會諗翻以前㗎啦。呢、這個所以咧，我我從我講嘢，你知我年紀有幾大㗎啦。啊，我都係講以前嘅嘢。咁而家好開心，我哋嘢可以重新啟航，有一個新嘅開始。So we are entering a new phase. 啊啊啊 ！New development for a Catholic centre 啊，咁咧喺呢度咧就誒誒，願主意你哋大家同在，咁咧就誒、呃、啊簡單同大家分享幾句，因為依家好似有短片嘅，所以我唔需要講得太多嚇、啊。多謝大家。多謝譚教授。咁而家我哋有請耶穌會中華省省會長周守仁神父致辭。教 Father Billen， 嗯，董神父，阿阿林教授，當然阿林教授，啊，同埋我哋咁多位嘅誒、呃、朋友，諸位兄弟姊妹，多位來賓，誒、呃，我我自己真係好開心嘅，雖然呢唔係口頭禪啊，誒、呃，因為咧，我哋耶穌會咧，中華省包括咗台灣、澳門、香港同埋內地，咁誒、呃，我哋每笪地方都有個誒。呃研究中心啦，啊 ，intellectual centre 啦，咁就嚇。咁喺北京我哋有有個佢哋 Beijing centre 喺度嘅。咁啊喺澳門嗰度有歷史學社啦，澳門歷史學社啦。喺台北咧，我哋有台北嘅歷史學社同埋我哋嘅神學院啦。咁係爭香港。咁都期望咗好耐，都好開心，我哋今次能夠啊參與咗呢一個咁有意義嘅一個誒 centre 啊。去去 sponsor 呢個 centre， 咁我都誒、呃、希望我就呢幾個而家一齊咧，咁我哋都成立咗一個 commission for intellectual porcelains。咁誒阿阿林教授佢就林博士啦 ，whatever <笑><笑>就。就佢佢而家都係呢個誒 commission 嘅成員啦。咁我希望就能夠耶穌會用我哋嘅傳統啦，我哋嘅靈修方法啦。
去、呃、contribute 做一個誒喺、呃、大中華區嘅一啲嘅研究啦，一啲 conversation 有關天主教嘅文化啦。天主教嘅誒、呃、靈修啦，同種種種咁，當然都係有耶穌會嘅我哋一啲大方向啦。咁誒、呃，所以好多謝大家今晚嚟，你對呢、這個你哋嘅臨在對我哋一個鼓勵，都係一個認為呢個係值得有嘅嘢。OK， 天主教嘅位。謝謝小神父。咁最後，我哋有請天主教研究中心新任主任林文君博士嘅支持。大家好。咁咧就頭先譚教授啊，同埋啊啊周神父咧出嚟都話，誒、哎、好開心。誒、呃、其實我都好開心，因為以我咁嘅年紀仲可以有嘢做，做咩嘢？<笑>咁咧就有啲人都話嚇，點、啊、解會轉工咧？咁即係呢個中心去做咧？咁咧就我頭先都食飯嗰陣時都有分享少少啦。我話即係過往喺大學工作咧，咁啊當然有教研啦，即、就、係、是、有教學有研究啦。咁但係有陣時咧就未必係真係做到自己想做嘅研究嘅，因為咧都要睇下即係而家即係學術界即係興啲乜嘢啦，係咪？邊啲先可以登出嚟啦咁樣。咁就我其實自己一路嘅研究興趣，當然都係倫理學啦，同埋咧就係宗教與政治之間嘅關係咁樣。咁但係咧，我我而家即係講宗教咧，就好似市場唔係幾好。咁所以咧，當即係神父啊、教授佢哋即係問我有冇興趣加入呢個團隊嘅時候咧，我就即係相當高興，因為我覺得呢一個係一個好好嘅平台咧，誒、呃、可以讓我。另外有啲嘢做啦，我頭先講，另外可以參與佢哋呢個咁有意義嘅工作，喺特別係喺呢個時代啦，喺呢個時候唔單止係即係香港，咁咧就因為神父佢哋都提出咗耶穌會總會咧，都係一個總方向咧，就係、是、希望我哋嘅主題會係喺修和嗰度 reconciliation。咁經過呢個暑假，我諗大家都會睇到呢一件呢、這個 ministry 呢一個使命咧，更加即係重要同埋有意思。咁咧就，所以我我亦都好開心能夠成為呢個團隊嘅一份子啦。咁咧，另外就係即係頭先都提到呢度，即係研究中心當然就係做研究啦，係咪？但係咧，即係耶穌會佢哋嘅傳統咧，就唔係淨係即係一啲好純粹嘅學術追尋，而係咧就話，即係呢個學術研究點樣能夠可以支援到喺前線嘅教育工作者或者牧民工作者？咁我覺得呢個好重要。<笑>即係如果唔係，我咪又好似以前一樣喺大學裏面做研究，做一啲純學術工作。誒、呃、喺期刊裏面登咗，不過咧就只係唔知十個八個人喺圖或者嗰本書喺喺圖書館裏邊。即係同前面，即係喺喺出邊面對好多生活嘅挑戰或者啊、嗯，其實我特別我哋研究倫理學咧，即係前線嘅經驗，我其實係俾我哋一個挑戰同埋讓我哋可以進步嘅一個一個平台。咁所以，我覺得、呃、天主教研究中心咧，都會喺未來嘅研究方向或者項目咧，都會係係循住呢個方向去去諗，就係、是、話我哋研究點樣能夠可以支援到即係前線嘅工作。另外，如果要能夠做到呢樣嘢咧，當然就係喺個研究工作就唔係純粹幾個教授喺度做，而係話我哋希望可以天主教研究中心成為一個交流嘅平台。真理唔係只係我哋喺圖書館裏面幾個人喺度思考，而係我諗今晚即係。就是神父佢哋嘅演講或者下主教嘅回應咧，都俾我睇到做神學或者做學問咧，要係同經驗連結埋一齊，或者我哋係由經驗開始先嘅。啊，咁咧就所以我哋中心未來嘅方向啦，會係以修和為一個主題，同埋我哋嘅定位咧，都係我頭先講，就係、是、以理論經驗一齊結合，希望可以喺呢個時候咧，喺呢個時代裏邊咧，點樣回應翻社會同埋教會嘅需要。回應翻天主俾我哋呢一份嘅召叫，多謝大家。我哋咧就有個簡單嘅儀式，象徵香港中文大學文宗系同耶穌會同埋天主教研究中心新領導層之間嘅合作。有請我哋今日嘅嘉賓啦，香港教區夏志成副理主教，本中心嘅另一位管理委員會成員，耶穌會董澤龍神父，同埋我哋嘅嘉賓講者偉倫神父 ，Father Joel Willen 一齊上前合照。咁跟住落嚟咧
我哋就會播放一段短片，回顧天主教研究中心過去十幾年嚟嘅歷史同埋工作，同埋未來嘅動向。大家好，我系天主教研究中心嘅主任林荣君。天主教研究中心嘅办事处咧，就喺我后面，梁球居留二楼二二零室。我同大家一齐去睇下。天主教研究中心同喺呢度其他嘅研究中心一样咧，都系隶属于中文大学文化及宗教研究系嘅。你可能谂下咧，就系话。誒點解當初咧喺二零零五年嘅時候咧，誒文化及宗教研究系咧會諗到要成立呢一個天主教研究中心咧？喺文化及宗教研究系成立嘅時候咧，咁其實我哋咧都開始咧就好多成立咗好多唔同嘅研究中心嘅，包括咧佛教啊、道教啊等等。咁我哋都咧因為有呢個崇基學院、神學院嗰個嘅設立啦，咁所以咧其實咧我哋喺基督新教嗰個嘅研究方面咧亦都相當唔錯嘅。咁但係一直咧，我哋都係缺欠咧，就喺呢一個嘅天主教研究嗰個嘅部分。咁喺當時咧，我哋咧就誒揾咗教區嘅主教陳日君書記，就同佢傾咧，就可唔可以俾我哋一啲嘅支持，等我可以成立呢個天主教研究中心咧？咁樣樣，咁佢咧就好快咧就俾一個好正面嘅答覆我哋。咁我哋就開始咗呢個天主教研究中心嗰個工作。其實咧，香港教區同埋耶穌會咧，都唔係話去到二零零五年咧。先至開始同中文大學有聯繫嘅，就好似湯若夢宿舍。天主教喺中文大學咧嗰個淵源好深嘅，大家都知道咧。誒，一九七一年開始咧，我哋就已經耶穌會已經係同聯合書院咧就一齊就建立呢個誒湯若夢宿舍，就提供咗誒四百幾個宿位。咁仲有一個係誒誒離殺點嘅，每個星期日九點半咧有一個英文離殺嘅，亦都由耶穌會咧提供呢個神師。咁另外喺我哋宗教系咧，誒即係我哋而家誒文化宗教研究系嘅前身啦。誒喺八十年代開始咧就已經有聖母無原罪傳教女修會 Sister La Bon 啊，就喺度任教呢個誒宗教教育嘅。咁所以可以見到而家差唔多咧，誒、呃、誒、呃、香港好多中學嘅宗教老師咧，都係佢一手訓練出嚟。咁另外就係耶穌會嘅 Father Shields 啊，施惠順神父。咁施神父一直咧，亦都係八十年代開始咧，就喺中文大學任教呢、這個誒、呃、天主教誒、呃、神學嘅。而天主教研究中心咧，喺二零零五年咧就正式成立咗啦。咁最初嘅時候，咁當然人數比較少啲啦。咁但係咧，就我哋咧到到慢慢咧，咁嚟到開展咗唔同嘅工作啦。咁包括我哋有出版我哋嘅期刊啦，有出版我哋嘅叢書啦，我哋有誒、呃、策劃誒唔、呃、同嘅啊學術研討會啦。咁呢個係俾學者嘅，咁亦都咧俾公眾人士咧，我哋有好多公開嘅講座啦。咁我亦都同唔同嘅學校咧有啲嘅聯繫，係搞一啲嘅誒活動咧，係幫助學校咧點樣嚟到教嗰個宗教教育啊。誒公民教育啊，即係等等咁樣樣。咁我哋好多嘅研究咧，都得到好多人嘅正面嘅評價，特別有關嚟天主教響香港或者中國嘅歷史啊等等咁樣樣。咁我哋有好多嘅出版物啊等等嚇。咁誒、呃，其實咧過去嗰十年咧，我都做咗好多嘅好大量嘅工作嘅。咁呢度有一個關鍵人物咧，就係、是、夏奇龍神父。夏奇龍神父咧一直都係主要嘅負責人物。我哋研究嘅項目咧，就可以好闊嘅，即係話神學啊、哲學啊、文化、宗教嘅藝術啊、建築啊、啊同埋歷史啊,啊都得嘅。不過咧，實質上我哋喺呢十幾年間咧，由於係啊譚永亮神父同我自己本身咧，都係比較熟悉於歷史嘅。而且咧，係有關香港天主教嘅歷史咧，係差唔多冇乜人做，咁所以咧，我哋就集中咗去研究本地天主教嘅歷史。咁呢個歷史又包括話修會嘅歷史啦，啊教育嘅歷史啦，就社會服務嘅歷史啦，仲有係啊傳教嘅歷史，呢幾方面我哋都做嘅。就我哋嘅負責嘅。啊，專教研究中心嘅主任咧，開始年紀都大啦
，咁我哋都要諗一諗咧，咁未來發展係點樣樣咧？咁咁依家剛好咧就是、一個好嘅契機咧，就耶穌會咧都有興趣咧去加入，係幫助我哋進一步去發展呢個天主教嘅研究。咁我相信咧。耶穌會咧就有一個係一個非常之國際性嘅一個嘅組織，喺國際嗰個聯繫方面係非常之強嘅。咁過去耶穌會咧喺學術上面嗰個嘅表現咧，亦都係非常之優秀嘅。好相信咧有耶穌會嘅加入之後咧，我哋嘅天主教研究中心嗰個嘅研究成果啊，學術上面嗰個嘅進展咧係會做得更加好嘅。嗱，耶穌會咧一路以嚟咧喺世界上其實從創會開始咧都離唔開教育嘅，即係去栽培。人才啦，無論喺教會內啊，師徒嘅培育啦，或者教會外一般青年人嘅培育啦，啊咁其實所以世界各地啊，尤其喺歐美啦，我哋辦唔少大學同埋中學嘅。咁喺香港大家都好熟悉啦，我哋兩間華人啦，一路以嚟啦，喺啊青年嗰個中學教育方面咧，係啊投入唔少資源嘅。咁但係一路以嚟，我哋有個心願啦，希望喺高等教育嗰度咧。能夠都繼續翻我哋嘅傳統啦。咁咧，耶穌會咧，佢秉承住佢哋修會嘅傳統同埋神恩啦。咁咧，把握住呢一個機遇，咁係資助啦，同埋參與咗中心嘅運作，同中心一齊咧，回應咗呢個社會嘅需要啦，同埋服務教會嘅使命。耶穌會喺教會嘅歷史裏邊啦，就係、是、喺教會同埋教會之外，我哋點樣能夠？將一份嘅誒人類嘅智慧、誒神學靈修嘅智慧都能夠係誒帶到去人嘅生命裏邊。咁我哋睇到呢個誒 centre 咧，都係一個好好嘅平台啊，俾我哋能夠繼續去喺唔同嘅範疇裏邊咧。特別我哋耶穌會誒覺得係特別係認為喺呢個時間要。點樣樣去服務我哋嘅教會、我哋嘅世界，喺靈修啦、陪伴貧窮同埋喺誒專業被被剝削嘅人士啦、年青人啦，同埋點樣一齊去共建一個美好嘅大家園？呢、這個係特別係講緊係環境啦，嚇。咁呢啲唔同嘅範疇裏邊，我哋點樣可以有深度啲去睇、去研究同埋去誒？呃計劃將來咧，咁呢啲都係一個呢個中心可以做到嘅時間。咁而家香港面對嘅問題啊，將個將來面對嘅問題，其實都係同我哋嘅信仰有關係。咁我哋點樣喺從耶穌會會是我哋嘅嘅，特別我哋依立著靈修裏邊，去點樣去認識了解呢啲事，點樣去分辨要行嘅路。一齊去分辨，唔係個人分辨。我點樣能夠而家推動緊就係共同分辨嘅嘅路？呢、这個係我哋都希望能夠藉著呢個中心咧，都有個平台去做到呢樣嘢。咁咧配合住教宗咧佢嘅牧民嘅指示啦，同埋咧耶穌會佢哋喺未來幾年咧有一個嘅普世嘅牧靈嘅即係取向嘅。咁咧中心咧都考慮咗啦，咁咧就係誒我哋都決定咧喺未來幾年裏邊咧都用修和作為我哋嘅發展嘅主題咁嘅。咁正係一個研究中心啦，我哋都會開展咧一啲唔同嘅研究項目嘅。咁嚟緊咧喺出年咧，我哋都會舉辦一啲嘅誒研討會啦。咁咧都係從嘗試咧從。啊，神學啦，啊，靈修啦，牧靈嘅角度啦，同埋咧就係、是、啊一啲社會科學嘅角度啦，咁咧就去探討呢一個寬恕同埋修和呢一個主題嘅。咁另外咧，我哋都會做一啲誒口述歷史嘅研究啦。咁咧就會主,主要咧負責咧就係誒華南總修院同埋聖神修院。咁另外咧就係天主教大專聯會。咁呢兩個咧暫時都係我哋未來呢一年。兩年裏面咧做嘅口述歷史嘅研究項目，咁咧仲有就係我哋都會有一個嘅、嗯、出版啦，咁咧會係做呢、這、一個、嗯、可持續發展同埋教會社會奮鬥，我哋打算咧會出一本書咁樣嘅，咁咧就回應翻而家呢個社會嘅情況啦，咁咧我哋其實都想了解一下年青人咧佢哋對一誒、嗯、收穫啦。寬恕同埋公義嘅一啲睇法，咁所以咧嚟緊呢一年度啦，咁我哋咧都會做一個嘅誒、嗯、大型啲嘅調查，咁咧主要去探討下咧就係十五至到二十二歲啦，即係話高中生同埋大
大學生咧，佢哋喺呢方面嘅睇法。咁因為咧，我哋會覺得咧，進行一啲嘅誒收穫嘅工作啊，或者喺學校裏面做呢一方面嘅價值教育咧，首先我哋都要了解下年青人點樣睇。咁咧就希望啦，喺嚟緊幾年裏面咧，中心咧會成為一個交流同埋對話嘅平台，能夠聯繫到咧唔同方面嘅人啦、資源啦，咁咧一齊咧為社會同埋教會去服務嘅。This is the time for the public lecture now. We would like to invite Dr. Lam to give an introduction to our guest speaker, Father Gerard Willen, and tonight's topic. Before I introduce our Father Dawood, our um, speaker tonight, um, I would like to give a big thank to our photographer, our cameraman, Nick Choi. Um, he's the producer of the video. And tonight is our honor and pleasure to have Father Jared um, Willen to be our speaker. Um, Father Willen is an Irish Jesuit and no need to mention your birthday, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, because uh, uh, next week you will celebrate your birthday. Yeah, okay. Um, he was ordained priest in 1992 and then got a PhD in theology in 1996. Yeah. And uh, he he was sent to uh, Nairobi to teach theology um, for uh, over 20 years. Yeah. And, but he, he's not only a, a theologian. Yeah, at that time, he also took responsibility of a parish. Um, so he's a parish priest. So quite balanced, you know, academic, intellectual, and also the uh, pastor in the parish. So his theology is, that's why he, he is interested in Bernard Lonergan. Lonergan's theology started from experience first, you know, the pastoral experience and help him to reflect uh, doing theology in the context. Um, and now he is teaching theology in um, Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. Um, and he has published many books on Lonergan. And the recent and the latest publication is this book, A Discerning Church, Pope Francis, Lonergan, and Theological Method for the Future. And that is the title of the public lecture tonight. Let's give a big applause to it. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Just before I start, I'd like to uh, repeat what I said last night. I was giving a talk last night as well. But uh, what a joy it is for me to visit Hong Kong for this my first time. But uh, it has been on my mind for many years, Hong Kong. Uh, you may know that many Irish Jesuits came to uh, Hong Kong. And uh, when I was joining the Jesuits in the early 1980s, I was very much considering missionary work. And the tradition of the Irish province had been to go to either Hong Kong or to Africa, to Zambia. And when I arrived, the option for Hong Kong had closed because there was the, uh, it, well, you, you had enough, you were able to do uh, your own work. But there was also the question of the handover from Britain to China. Um, so I went to Zambia. Uh, but I might have come to Hong Kong had I been older. I, uh, I was fascinated to hear uh, the, how committed the missionaries were to learning the language, how it took three years to get to a level that, frankly, I was able to get in Zambia in three months with, with the language I was learning there. So it was a, a very challenging here, but fascinating. And of course, we always remember the image of uh, St. Francis Xavier dying on what island here, I'm not certain. San Sien. In, in view of, of mainland China. It, it's, it's a haunting image for the whole society of Jesus. 
and uh, finally, as I said yesterday, I worked for many years with Christian life communities. And, uh, we always knew that Hong Kong was a, a strong center of, of CLC. I know there are some members here today. Yes, the uh, various people, as, as last night. So anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. And just to say, it's exciting uh, to be uh, associated with the founding of this um, Center for Catholic Studies. So um, the, that sets a backdrop for this talk. And it's why, well, uh, I, why I was invited, I suppose, because uh, I've already been working on this question of what, what is the significance of Pope Francis for theology? Uh, as you see from the title, a discerning church, Pope Francis and theological method. Uh, the, you're going to get quite a lot of Lonergan tonight, I should warn you, even though he's not in the title. Uh, but let me just stay with uh, the, that's the, the book, um, the, the question of the theological method of Pope Francis. You may have heard of Cardinal Walter Casper. He's a, um, a cardinal, was in charge of ecumenism uh, in the Vatican. Uh, but he was the first theologian mentioned on day two by Pope Francis after Pope Francis was elected. And uh, Pope Francis gave s signals that uh, he considers Cardinal Casper to be an authoritative interpreter of his thought. So uh, here's Father Sean. I shook Father Sean's hand yeah, yesterday already. So uh, welcome, Father Sean. OK, not at all. Um, the, uh, so Cardinal Casper wrote this excellent book that I recommend, very small. It's really a speech, a talk, uh, published as a booklet. Um, Pope Francis' revolution of tenderness and love. He starts saying, everybody knows that Pope Francis is new. There's something new about Pope Francis. What is it? Then he jokes and he says, well, he's still Catholic. And he's, <laughs> he, he's Orthodox, just like the other uh, popes. So he then starts explaining, the difference with Pope Francis appertains to method, the method of approach to theology and to pastoral work. Now, I've done my own uh, version of, of, of really what C C Cardinal Casper also says, and describe uh, three characteristics of the method of Pope Francis that are distinctive of him. Discernment, an inductive approach, and an option for the poor. Now, I'll be explaining that more later, but you see that dis discernment looms large. Uh, just to note, one in his very early months, he gave a, um, a very long interview to a Jesuit called Father Spadaro uh, that was published in Jesuit journals all around the world. Uh, it was really about his pontificate, his, of course, his vision for the pontificate. But it was also a kind of private conversation between two Jesuits. And he talked a lot about Jesuit identity to, to this other Jesuit. And so some other people were a bit confused because it was also about the, the vision of the pontificate. But uh, Father Spadaro asked him, what's your, your first approach to being Pope? And he said, discernment. And he spoke at length about Ignatian spirituality and how an attitude of discernment has always characterized him. And he said, just as well, because I have an impulsive personality, and I have learned by many mistakes that the first decision I make is usually the wrong decision. <laughs> So I have to wait and discern and act more prudently. So this characteristic of Pope Francis, which is part of the newness of him, he's so disarming and honest. So I want to uh, talk a little bit more now about the significance of this shift of method. I consider it epoch changing. And well, we'll have to wait and see, do the next popes follow this? But I want to argue that there is something special about Pope Francis as an interpreter of Vatican II. The time was right for Pope Francis. There's a moment of maturity in the church, 50 years after Vatican II, where we're able to settle into a kind of a balanced way of appreciating what is novel about Vatican II. And I suggest that the thought of Bernard Lonergan is a special help in explaining the significance of Pope Francis. Well, this, the significance of the moment that we're experiencing in the church for theology. So obviously, the relevance of this for launching the Center for Catholic Studies should be direct. So 
So in this talk, uh, I'm afraid I've reversed the order of the handout you got. Part one and part two are in a different order now. Uh, so I start talking about Bernard Lonergan, Foundations for Interdisciplinary Method. And then I apply the categories of Lonergan to name the moment that Pope Francis represents, the theological method of Pope Francis. So, foundations for an interdisciplinary method, already said that. The summary of the terms, of terms that I have to explain to you are a historically conscious church using general empirical method. It's a very technical vocabulary. Pope Francis is the most historically conscious pope ever. The, uh, that's a phrase taken from the introduction to my book, uh, written by a Lonergan, very eminent expert called Robert Dorn. So, the young Lonergan, if I may explain a little bit about him biographically, and I weave in then the intellectual uh, achievement of Bernard Lonergan, and then eventually, of course, applied to Pope Francis. If you think about your own lives, perhaps, uh, the, those of you that are a bit older, perhaps, uh, your 20s, 30s are the, the time when you set your direction for your life. This is the great importance of, of university studies, of course, for young people. But this is where you've got past your teenage years and you become, you establish the person you will probably be for decades to come. And certainly for intellectuals, for academics, this is the case. So by the time Lonergan was hitting 30-ish, I want to suggest that there were four main interests that had formed him that would actually result in his greater academic publications in subsequent years. Neo-scholasticism, he disliked it. So we're talking the 1920s. Uh, Bernard Lonergan was born in 1904. He was a Canadian, joined the Jesuits after high school and was sent at a fairly early stage to study in England. There he studied, as all seminarians and priests to be did at the time, a very narrow kind of form of philosophy, and then it would, it would be the same of theology, like what was called later a decadent Thomism. He was convinced that it was not responding to the times. This was a set of abstract, rigid categories that defended the truth he wasn't opposed to the, 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 the tradition that it carried, uh, but it didn't explain the, the, the tradition of Christianity very well, in his opinion. And he, all of these people of that generation who were bright anticipated the developments of Vatican II in this way, and therefore suffered for a lot of their training for the priesthood. Analytical philosophy. Uh, the, there was an irony, a rich irony, in the life of, of uh, Bernard Lonergan and in the life of the British province of the Jesuits at that time. They ran a lot of Catholic secondary schools in England, and there was an agreement with the government to pay the salaries of the Jesuits and anybody else employed in those schools. As long as those teachers had a civil degree in a secular university. So the brighter students were sent to do two degrees at the same time. In addition to the philosophy in the seminary, they studied in the University of London, these uh, Jesuits. Uh, so, uh, Lonergan did his, uh, his, his uh, classics, <coughs> mathematics, and philosophy in a, in a, a, a pr preliminary degree. But the irony was this. In many ways, they were learning the same thing in the version in the Catholic seminary and in the university, especially with regards to philosophy. And he said he and all his fellow students, his, his fellow seminarians, scholastics as we call them, agreed the secular studies were much better. <laughs> so for reasons of money, the authorities and the Jesuits didn't realize what they were doing, but they were undermining their own education by sending these Jesuits off to get uh, the qualifications for a salaried job later. Now, he wasn't an uncritical admirer of British philosophy, what they call Anglo-American uh, philosophy, but he recognized an elementary point that what had happened with the scientific revolution, with the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, 
was significant for goodness sake. And this was not recognized by a neo-scholastic philosophy of theology. There was a medieval philosophy defending itself in the modern era in the Catholic Church in the years prior to Vatican II. So the church needed to modernize. It needed to speak to these times. And at least the analytical philosophers were trying to do that. But how best to do it? John Henry Newman. Lonergan was convinced that he found something in the writings of John Henry Newman, who was not an analytical philosopher by any means, but he was this genius. You all know him, I suppose, and you know that he was made a saint a few days ago, uh, so this is very current. But he is one of the major influences on Bernard Lonergan. And the point is this. How do you engage with modern science and mo modern thought as a Christian? How do you justify your grammar of assent, is the title of the book. How do you justify the act of faith as a modern rational person? So he spent all his life writing on this topic, as well as others. But uh, Newman's basic option was to turn to interiority. <coughs> Something a natural scientist would never do, something the analytical philosophers cannot do, and they cannot understand Lonergan if you start talking to them. But he said, you have to recognize that the same person, I don't want to say the same mind, the same person, heart and mind, that can produce natural science can also produce ethical judgments. And he believed that analytical philosophy was weak in getting from the is to the ought. So even in the realm of ethics, he felt that this uh, British-American philosophy had, had its limits. But then what about religion? How do you make an ascent of faith to a transcendent God? Well, he says, you just do. You who produce natural science are quite capable of an act of faith as well. But we have to recognize there's this con something constant in the human person that has these different modes of action. <coughs> It might seem very obvious, but it was very different from the prevailing thought, both in analytical philosophy and in Christian theology. Alternative to Karl Marx, this created fascination for a uh, question time uh, yesterday, uh, the, and I wasn't able to explore it. Uh, when Lonergan finished in the 1930s, uh, in the 1920s, uh, his, his studies in England. He came to an, the next stage, as all we Jesuits do, of a pastoral experience between philosophy and theology. It's just that, by the way, he got into trouble with his superior and he was delayed longer. He had to do four years of this pastoral work before moving to theology. But he had a wonderful experience. He went back to his, uh, his old secondary school where he had himself been a student in, in uh, Montreal. But not very sad as well. Why? Because the Great Depression had just descended on Canada as it did all the rest of Europe and, and North America. So he witnessed children who came from fairly well-off backgrounds coming hungry to school. Their parents unemployed, their fathers unemployed, friend, that might have been professional people, literally begging at, at, at food handout centers. Being an intellectual, he was convinced that this crash had a, an intellectual cause. It was bad economic theory informing bad political policies that had contributed to the Great Depression. He, within a few years, would become very aware of the, the growth of fascism, Nazism, in, in Europe in the 1930s. Overall, he was aware that there was a crisis of civilization. And he started to read a lot of historians who wrote on that theme. But he remembered one good professor, at least, that he had had in his seminary in, back in England. This man had said, the Catholic Church has to update itself to engage with the times. A key thinker of our times is Karl Marx. It's visionary now for a professor in a Jesuit seminary in the 1920s. He said, the genius of Karl Marx was to recognize that you have to develop two lines of thinking, a theory of history and a theory of economics. 
So he said, the Catholic Church, Christianity, has to develop an alternative to Karl Marx. But it needs to be modern in the sense of developing a theory of history and then a theory of economics. The point about a theory of history, like Marx, would be that in order to intelligently and responsibly direct history, you must have a certain ability to decode what is happening and therefore to know how to act. So I finished with the young Lonergan. The Lonergan, in some respects, is considered to be a two-book man. Uh, these two masterworks he's known for. First, it's called Insight. Uh, the, that's supposed to be a person having an insight. Uh, and the second is a Method and Theology. This is in continuity with John Henry Newman. You can imagine why a book called Insight would be attending to interiority. So I now move a little bit to the, the system of Lonergan's thought. Uh, Lonergan spoke about three stages of meaning in human history. He was in dialogue with all sorts of authors. I won't go into that now. But he said that the real one approach to understanding what's happening in the broad sweep of history is to understand how do cultures produce meaning how do they understand their world? He says at a first stage, it's really the stage of indigenous peoples. I had a nice photograph, I lost my slide, of Pope Fr uh, Fr Francis meeting with the um, indigenous people of the Amazon at the Synod recently. Um, the, the fundamental approach to meaning that we all experienced in all of our cultures, if you go back far enough, was that of the indigenous traditional cultures today. It is especially in tune with nature and understands human living in continuity with the cycles of nature. Next came the breakthrough to a theoretic differentiation of meaning. There are theorists like uh, the, the um, philosopher Jaspers who spoke about the axial period about 600 BC, and Lonergan followed this line. When there's a breakthrough in cultures that aren't directly connected with each other, but they do something similar in different parts of the world. You had Buddha, you had Confucius, you had a bit earlier, you had Zoroastrianism in, in Iran, and you had a differentiation within Judaism, the time of the prophets. But not, last and not least, you had Greek philosophy. So the, he, he pursues the question of what, what the Greeks did. You know, Socrates asked the question, what is justice? He had gone around to different cities, and they all had their gods. They all had their narratives, quite connected to primal culture. And he was saying, look, or the Greeks were, were going around and were aware of the different gods of the different cities. And this helped them break through to saying, well, look, what is true in all of these cities? What is a just city, for example? They all want this, and they, they, they talk about how their gods are helping it, but uh, they don't know how to communicate with each other. So various characteristics of the breakthrough to theory. It was a breakthrough to metaphysics, very distinctly different from the, the stage of meaning before it. A conviction that there is a reality that we can't see. There is a reality that is foundational to what we do see with the cycles of nature, etc. Also, the beginnings of a paradox uh, to recognize that there's something about meditation, about a turn to our own interiority, that helps us be in tune with the metaphysical. So, Lonergan would add that really most of human history has been continually within this theoretic differentiation of meaning because he understands the development of modern science as still within this differentiation of meaning. It's just that with modern science, the categories of theory change. So instead of talking like Aristotle talked about trying to find the permanent causes to define something, that's the material cause, the formal cause, the efficient cause, the final cause, Identify those things, and you have a permanent and abstract definition of the thing you're studying, a tree or whatever. 
along come all the series of, of leaders of, of the scientific revolution, culminating, for example, in Isaac Newton, who would basically talk about the mathematization of the universe. You study change. Aristotle didn't like change. He wanted the permanent oak tree that, uh, in its prime, and he would then study what are the causes of the tree and explain it. The scientists like change. They study change, and they try to follow the empirical method that we all know about. You observe the data. You try to formulate a hypothesis about the mathematical law that is being followed. Let's say the, the turning of planets around, around the sun. Then you test this hypothesis by its predictability. So this was the revolution, the change of method within the theoretic differentiation of consciousness. Now, Lodigan says we are at the borderline of a new epoch, and that that epoch requires that we turn to interiority, so echoes of, of John Henry Newman here, that life has got so complex, our fancy technological competence walked us into the First World War, the Second World War, the genocides of the 20th century. So we're very sophisticated in our theoretic differentiation of conscious, consciousness in the modern mode, but we're not very wise so a lot of philosophers are like existentialist philosophers, uh, for example, after the Second World War in Europe, were talking about, well, we've got to integrate ethics in some way better than this reductionistic, scientistic way of thinking that we've been having. Lonergan believes that the way forward is along the lines that Newman prophesized, which is attending to the human person who is the producer of these different realms of knowing, and yet has something constant that can be recognized as a human person. So I'm now going to explain a little bit of Lonergan's analysis of interiority. But we remember the point is to get going with the, the world, the external world. We're not just indulging in some sort of spiritual practice that we're, we're fascinated by. We, we, we explore our interiority so as to give us a structure for engaging coherently and with wisdom in the world. But to start with, what are the characteristics of human interiority? Lonergan suggests that, let me start at the third, intellectual authenticity has always been possible for people, whether we're true to it or not. The, um, but then moral conversion uh, he talks about it. There are moments when people uh, can decide to be a good person. Young adulthood, you hope that, that that's what happens at, at university stage. But then he talks about this mysterious experience that is available to everybody, he believes. You don't have to be Christian. Christians know more about its origin. But uh, religious conversion is something to do with this the striving to self-transcendence of an individual who suddenly meets an, an, an obscure it, he says at one stage, an obscure other who nevertheless we recognize as making an offer of unconditional love to us. At a certain stage we say yes to that offer at some sort of fundamental level of our being. And then we feel, well, what Christians would call the love of God flooding our hearts. And that in turn is the an engine of moral conversion and intellectual authenticity. Lonergan says that has always been the way. But he now wants to talk about intellectual conversion. Philosophically speaking, we need to affirm that in a more structured way than ever before. And it, it is the direction of modern philosophy to bring us to that point. He talks about how human studies in the 1800s started to apply the empirical method of natural science to matters human. But as, as um, uh, Father Tong said yesterday, some of them who were not analytical philosophers who, who refused to go in this direction were saying, look, the data of consciousness is data as well as the data of our eyes 
the, the planets going around the sun, etc. We are able to attend to ourselves with a kind of empirical quality, phenomenology as a, a, a hermeneutical philosophy, existentialist philosophy, the German historicists, the, I all go in this direction. Lonergan then had his, his own way of retrieving the thought of Thomas Aquinas, who, who he admired very much, uh, in dialogue with this, this phase of modern philosophy, uh, which is on the verge of postmodern philosophy, really. But he said, look, as philosophers, we need to engage in an act of intellectual conversion. We need to affirm that we are constructed like this. So it re really means I. I invite each of you to think of an important decision you made in your life. If you made it well, recognize how you passed through experience, insight, judgment to that decision. The, uh, now, the, there is a complication that Lonergan talks about in terms of bias. We might recognize that that's, our consciousness is structured in that way. But if we're honest, we'll admit we just don't use that authentically. This is not a very good uh, diagram. I could better have done sort of arrows flying off in the wrong direction, but I put it in red anyway. We fail against the dictum of being attentive to experience. The wait for insight and register when we have understood something. Sometimes we think any old insight is true, but it's not necessarily. There's another level of consciousness that affirms or denies the insights we have had. Sometimes we jump straight from experience to judgment. We think that knowing is like taking a good look and the conclusion is obvious, especially if I'm angry enough about something. On the other hand, there are times when we fail to judge when our consciousness leads us to do because we're afraid of what we're going to judge and what it might lead, lead us to, to, to know we should do. But beyond judging the cold facts, there's the decisions and of course, there we all know about bias. St. Paul who said, the good I know I should do, I don't. The good I know I shouldn't do, I do. But remember, bias is actually at every, every level. So we're in trouble. Lonergan talks about the moral impotence of people. Because our biases form vicious circles that make authenticity more difficult the next time. We form bad habits. The, so now he's talking in this intellectually converted way about the religious conversion and its consequences that I mentioned before. So he talks about two lines of development. Development, development from above as well as development from below. So that religious conversion that I described earlier that is available to everybody we can now analyze more carefully in terms of our intellectual conversion and speak of, well, it's very mysterious because there's a whole passive side to it. Here is us who are striving for truth, striving for something. But when you have the experience of religious conversion, there's a, this joyous passivity uh, where it is different from what you expected, different from what you were striving for. But paradoxically, the fulfillment of that striving. So uh, he then talks about how the <coughs> religious conversion flows into moral conversion and intellectual conversion, if you're a philosopher, uh, and helps you be consistently attentive, intelligent, rational, responsible. Now, this is not just spirituality. It's a fundamental of academic method for Lonergan. So he talks, now this is the most difficult um, section. I'm going to spend two weeks talking around it in, in, a, cor in a course that I have uh, back in Rome. Um, the, I don't even know what diagram to put up there. But we've, we've already mentioned that we explore interiority so as to get back into the world. And let's remember, we have a notion of objectivity in our intellectual conversion because we're talking about judgment of truth, of facts. So Lonergan says, if we're able, if, if I affirm myself as a knower, I know being, there's something of being that is constant in everything I affirm, then 
There must be something in the structure of being that lends itself to be known in these three levels of consciousness, especially experience, understanding, judgment. And then we deal with decision and value, say, in, in another moment. So whatever is going on inside our heads, in a certain sense, goes on in being, in the order of being. So a first step here is he retrieves Aristotle, matter, form, existence. That's really Aquinas more than, than Aristotle. And he says, experience, understanding, judgment, anticipates, is, is connected to the elements of being that are matter, form, and existence. But then he points out how one insight builds on another. One act of judgment builds on another act. We gain higher viewpoints. And he's very mathematical himself, so he, he has chapters in insight where he talks about modern science, classical science, and um, statistical science. And he ends up saying, if, if we have this, these ways of knowing, we can talk about the reality, the real order of the universe as characterized by emergent probability. So he's, he, he's like Darwin, in a sense. There's an evolutionary notion of being that passes through different levels that has part to do with this isomorphism between the fluidity, the flexibility, the, the, the the organic development of our thinking mind and the organic development of the universe. But the point then is that he's, what about the human moment in an emergently probable universe? Well, what extra does the human bring as a level of being? Every level of, higher level of being is different in some way than the previous, but it's still part of this order of an emergently probable universe. But humans bring freedom and intelligence. So instead of just being a product of the evolution within being, we produce the next st stages of being by our acts of intelligence. So you know, don't wait for ears to disappear or us to grow even taller than me, all of us, uh, which is a, a physical probability in, in, in evolution. Look at human culture. Look at human history. That's where the emergently probable universe is developing. If some of you have read Teilhard de Chardin, and there are echoes here of Teilhard de Chardin as well as Darwin. It's like a Darwinian attitude uh, applied to history. So that's just for starters. Uh, I continue now talking about history. Remember this. English Jesuit telling Lonergan, you need to develop a theory of history to parallel that of Karl Marx. In Insight, he starts moving in this direction, saying that we, within the metaphysics of an emergently probable universe, we have the instruments to talk about a theory of history. So again, I would need longer to talk on this. This is just an, a, a, um, a diagram I put together. The, uh, the, to explain Lonergan's categories of history. He uses the metaphor of vector analysis. Uh, so in it, studying any one situation, it is comprised at the same time, one situation in movement. It is to be understood in terms of three vectors, progress, decline, and redemption. Now we've already spoken about the touchstone in human interiority, which is authenticity, bias, and religious conversion. So by analogy with that analysis of interiority, Lonergan talks about progress, decline, and redemption. Progress is what things would be like if everybody had been authentic at the level of technology, economics, politics, and the culture that guides the, the process of change that passes through technology, economics, and politics. What a dream, if we were all angels. Decline it starts to approximate the reality, but we want to say there's a mixture of progress and decline in, in any situation we study. So decline is just the lack of attentiveness, lack of intelligence, lack of, of a rational good judgment. Above all, lack of responsible goodness in the decisions that have been made. 
He talks about different kinds of bias that have a social import. Very obviously, group bias is where elites distort the, uh, the process of progress. This is what Karl Marx talked about, and he wasn't wrong in the, the, the class oppression that he, that he described. Lonergan adds, however, general bias is the most cancerous of bias, biases. It is, when, it is when people distrust the use of reason at a popular level. When, pe when, when people can be, ex the whole culture rejects as stupid eggheads people who are naming problems and trying to develop responsible policy suggestions to change problems. Oh, they're tree huggers, gets, gets rid of ecology. Uh, oh, they're resentful uh, lefties, gets rid of a critique of inequality in the modern economy. And a population that refuses to accept the role of intellectual reflection in culture suffers from a general bias. So it's a godsend, you might say, in fact, it's not a godsend, to elites that want to distort popular sentiment by emotive reasoning. We don't have to worry about uh, actual uh, reasoning. And we see that all around us in the world today, needless to say. Um, so moral impotence, I mentioned in terms of private uh, living. But what Lonergan really means is moral impotence is the state of our human societies and culture. Decline is always stronger than progress, left to itself, if they're left to themselves. Bad habit form forms the next generation into bad habits. So there, there is a success, there's a destiny for success in decline that is always more powerful than progress. So towards the end of his book, Insight, he, he, he's trying to stay philosophical. He becomes theological in his later method of theology. But he says, only a divine solution for the problem of evil can solve the problem of moral impotence. There has to be a second intervention of the God that created a historically probable universe. Because evil at the human level is distorting the possibility of any further progress. So that's how he explains the vector of redemption. The, it starts with this, well, with Jesus Christ entering history. Uh, we know that, but he can explain it more anonymously. You know the term from Karl Rahner, anonymous Christians. Uh, it starts with this experience of religious conversion, however people might name it, that is um, available to everybody. But it is supernatural, and that's why we put it at a different starting place. It starts from somewhere mysterious, but it empowers us. Lonergan then explains at length some philosophical anticipation of the characteristics of such a divine solution, if it exists. It's a kind of game he plays at the end of Insight, pretending to still be a philosopher. But basically he says a couple of things. One is that it must be in continuity with the actual order of the universe. So he can't create an emergently probable universe and then switch it off just even, even for, to save, save souls. So it must involve some kind of return to authenticity of people who still have to get back to the hard work of progress, using their attentiveness, their intelligence, their rationality, and their responsibility to do two things, and that's, I try to characterize that in this um, diagram. Reverse decline and promote progress. So he speaks about redemption, the job actually speaking explicitly about preaching, communicating the word of God as, as a Christian. He says, it must draw, the, any preacher must in, be intimately familiar with the culture of the people being preached to. That there must be an understanding of the virtual resources within the culture to let progress be built to further progress, but also to differentiate progress from decline and to reverse decline. So redemption is the community of people in history that reverse decline and promote progress. Now, I'm almost finished because, as you can imagine, um, it's, I'm going to skip that, it's, um, we're at discernment now. 
this is longer than a sophisticated, more academically articulated account of discernment. It, discernment involves reading progress, decline, redemption in a situation. And then his whole book that I haven't talked much about, Method in Theology, is a means to help a community of a religious tradition mediate redemption to history, be a catalyst of further progress in history and a reversal of decline. So if I had my book, I'd show it up. A, a, a discerning church. Uh, what, I, what I really meant was something that wouldn't work in a title. A church that is that follows the transcendental precepts, that wouldn't work. A church that is attentive, that is intelligent, that is rational, that is responsible, that would be a bit better. But a church that engages in dialectic method, that would lose all my purchasing uh, audience. But it, it calls it a dialectic method to distinguish progress, decline, and redemption as already present in a situation. And then do your theology, if, if you're a religious person, to um, figure out how to help redemption take its next step. Okay. Uh, now, yesterday I abbreviated my section on Lamergan, and I'm afraid today I'm going to abbreviate my section on um, uh, Pope Francis. Pope, Pope Francis. But uh, the, uh, our timekeeper has not shown me my 10 minutes yet. How many minutes have I left? 20 minutes. Uh, I'll be less. I'll, I'll be less than that. So, perhaps you catch my point. Uh, Pope Francis is works primarily at a pastoral level, but he has serious theology behind him. And I'm going to talk about that now. And it has a lot to do with Vatican II. But what I'm really doing is trying to offer a support for Pope Francis from the thought of Bernard Lamerton, who Pope Francis did not read. So my exercise is an academic dialogue. I'm, it, this is, my book is not really about Pope Francis. It's about naming the moment that Pope Francis represents that has a significance far beyond his, his pontificate and is an authentic expression of Vatican II, I believe. So, um, well, if I was in class now, I'd ask people to stand up and take a rest or talk to each other. Are you okay for energy? Uh, that was very dense. I gave you what I, I, if I spent a semester on this, people still don't understand me. Uh, so, uh, on the other hand, by the way, uh, I'm very touched by how much there is, in, at least in Jesuit culture, and uh, uh, I'm talk, talking with um, Professor uh, Lamb as well, um, a familiarity with Lonergan at a certain intellectual level in Hong Kong. That, uh, that is not to be taken for granted. Uh, it, it doesn't happen everywhere. Uh, so I've been feeling very at home as I communicate these passions uh, as I do. Um, the, so anyway, if I move on again to my uh, content, if we're ready to, uh, to keep going. Okay, I've already talked about this, and uh, Bishop Ha will be responding especially to uh, an article I wrote uh, the, uh, and circulated in advance of this talk, uh, talking about these three components of the method of Pope Francis. Perhaps you can already see uh, how it's compatible with what Lonergan is, is saying. So the discernment, it underlies these more complicated intellectual matters that I call dialectical analysis and theological method. It is, it's, it's a discerning approach, but the term discernment becomes analogical at this stage. It's important to recognize when you're, for the minority of us that, that are called to do this, when we're working in the academic field, discernment morphs into something that is that passes through intellectual conversion and uh, uh, dialectical method, theological method. Um, okay, um, I want to suggest, I'm going to give a bit of a history of, of theology briefly to locate Pope Francis uh, in it. Uh, Vatican II, according to Lonergan, uh, represented the, um, the shift towards historical consciousness, towards interiority, towards the kind of method that comes from an interior differentiation of meaning um, that is epochal for the future of Christianity. However, that's rather implicit in Vatican II. Uh, there's ways of talking that through. I do so in a couple of chapters in my book. They didn't, define, they didn't say that officially, 
So uh, you, it, the Vatican II is a marker event in an epoch-changing approach that is far from adequately articulated, let alone completed. So uh, let's just for a moment notice the, what did happen. I want to talk about two of the major documents of Vatican II, which were both about the church. Lumen Gentium is the first. Gaudium et Spes, the church in the modern world, is the second. And already from the title of the second, it's clear that we're talking about something more in process in history. Lumen Gentium, just to mention one thing, it changed the vocabulary for the church from emphasizing hierarchy and institution to the people of God that travels in history along with the other peoples of the earth and is trying to mediate kingdom values until Christ comes again. So this is a historically conscious metaphor, the people of God. And if you remember my diagram, it's perfectly compatible with the church as mediating redemption in history, trying to reverse decline and promote progress. Gaudium et Spes is um, more remarkable still. Lumen Gentium talks about the church ad intra. Gaudium et Spes talks about the world. So I thought it, it's the place where the ad extra mission really becomes clear. It uh, is influenced by the young Catholic workers movement. Whoops, press the wrong button there. Um, the, uh, um, the, sorry, oh yeah, I'm going to go ahead. Uh, if you're reading that, you're, you're getting my punchlines. I shouldn't, uh, I shouldn't have shown you those slides at all. Um, a method that is an inductive method. Uh, that what they would call an inductive method coming from this uh, tradition of this young Christian workers, see, judge, act. We're probably all fairly familiar with that. Pope Francis does this with synods. Synods are all about the stage of seeing, judging, so as to allow the magisterium judge and act, and, and us with the magisterium. So uh, the um, Lonergan uses the vocabulary it's the same point as the move from the second stage of meaning to the third stage of meaning. He says the move from classicism to historical consciousness is the drama of Vatican II. It's actually the drama of world culture. It's the epoch change that we are called to pass through. Uh, and the, um, well, it's a little bit up for grabs. Long ago, uh, uh, Vatican II started it, but didn't complete it, as I say. So this is just an example. There was one expert in Vatican II. Lonergan was technically one of the experts, but he wasn't very active. One of them was called John Courtney Murray. He virtually wrote one of the documents, which was very significant, on religious freedom. Uh, the, uh, so the, it was the basis for Catholic social teaching, uh, because if we didn't respect the freedom of people, we couldn't, uh, it, it implies that we want to force our religion on them through a Catholic king which actually had been the teaching of the church until 1965. It was a medieval teaching. Um, so he helped that change. It, it was a presupposition for a lot of the rest of Vatican II, but it, it was very controversial. There was intense opposition to the document and to him personally. Things got nasty at committee level. Uh, he had suffered a lot in the 1950s. He had been censored by the church, uh, as many uh, theologians had been, like Karl Rahner who would eventually write the documents of Vatican II, all very dramatic. But he read Lonergan, and he was using Lonergan real time in the debates in Vatican II. So you see that he, this is a quotation from him, and I've just got the bottom bit, the clash between classicism and historical consciousness. But here's the rest of the quote. So he's talking about the intense acrimony within committees, the abortive dialogue seems to indicate where the real issue lies. The first and second views, conservatives, progressives, do not confront each other as affirmation confronts negation. Their differences are at a deeper level, indeed at a level so deep that it would be difficult to go deeper. They represent the contemporary clash between classicism and historical consciousness. So he's explicitly using Lonergan. So he means that Without religious conversion, moral conversion, emanating an intellectual conversion, your horizon is so different from somebody else 
that there is a complete inability of those other people to understand you. So the classicist mentality would be people of good faith going to heaven, but rigid in thinking, because they can't see how using anything but abstract ideals can preserve objectivity of Christian doctrine. Alternatively, if you're intellectually converted, you know that judgment protects objectivity, but it comes as the culmination of a process that passes through experience and understanding and should probably be done in community. There's a community that is experiencing, trying to understand new things, a decision-making uh, process that comes up as a culmination of that. So you can see what I'm getting at is that that is still the case today. But look at what Lonergan wrote in 1965. There is, after Vatican II, there is bound to be formed a fragmented left following now this fashion, now that fashion. There is bound to be formed a monolithic right determined to live in a world that no longer exists. But what will count is the not numerous middle, the not numerous center, that is going to do the hard work of retrieving the, the wisdom of the past and med mediating it in meaningful ways to the question of the present. Now, Lonergan's entire book, Method in Theology, is devoted to that process of mediation, retrieval and communication. So, now, I hesitated to put this uh, photograph on. Uh, it's produced by one of the right-wing blogs at the moment, and it's anti-Pope Francis. Uh, but the title actually is a book from a more reputable um, uh, author, The Battle for Meaning of Vatican II. Well, we have lived through, those of us who are 50 years plus uh, 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 old, what the rest of you have um, got the tail end of, is 50 years of relative controversy about how to make the shift from classicism to historical consciousness, or how to deny that we should do it. So we have lived this reality of a fragmented left and a monolithic right. I don't want to go into all of the details, but broadly speaking, the 1970s had a lot of fragmented left about them. Uh, the uh, 80s, under Pope John Paul II, a return to a necessary control of, of orthodoxy but arguably not in a very historically conscious way. With Pope Francis, I, um, the, I don't have it there, there, but those three characteristics, discernment, inductive method, a preferential option for the poor, is the way forward, in my opinion. Now, of 10 minutes, uh, let's see if I can even beat that. Um, briefly, I want to say that uh, Pope Francis inherits a tradition of interpreting Vatican II that passes through Latin America, obviously. Some of the characteristics, they took Gaudium et Spes more seriously than most other continents. Well, I can't really speak for Asia, but they, 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 of course they're a strong church in, in Latin America, numerous Catholics. Uh, the, so the, they were saying, however, Gaudium et Spes was obviously written by Frenchmen and Germans uh, because it has the tone of European optimism, which was appropriate in the 1960s. This is the, the dilemma with historical consciousness. You need to keep on rewriting your theology because you're responding to the times and times change. And even between continents at the same time, situations are different. So the bishops of Latin America who had been relatively silent and listening during Vatican II started to move fairly quickly saying, look, it's so obvious that what is characteristic of Latin America is the cry of the poor profound poverty, inequality, and extreme violent repression because the Cold War is being fought out in, the, in our countries in Latin America. The liberation theology started to reflect on with modern hermeneutical uh, resources saying, look, an option for the poor isn't just handing food to your hungry neighbor. It is a whole hermeneutical attitude we, we, we feel the pain, we feel a solidarity with the poor that we encounter. And we do our theology in the light of that. We retrieve the religious tradition in the light of a burning desire to do something for the poor. With a modern awareness that social, just, uh, social structures can be part of the um, oppression of the poor and therefore of the 
what needs to be evangelized if, if the poor are going to be helped. Is this Marxism or is it not? Uh, well, it was to a certain degree. They, they used quite a lot of Marxist instruments in the early years of liberation theology. That was a mistake, and people like Gustavo Gutierrez, who was in the, the front line of that, admits that now. It was a process of maturing. So Pope John Paul was correct in many ways in, in intervening against those Marxist tendencies. However, there was already a self-correcting process going on in Latin America. In Argentina, the uh, theologians were developing a version of liberation theology that was allergic to Marx for various reasons. That's actually Perón. Uh, the, uh, they had a political culture that was kind of more populist, more left of center. Uh, I, I, I shouldn't even mention, but if it, it doesn't tend towards Marxism, it might tend towards fascism. Uh, but it depends on what kind of Peronism you're talking about. But they would never be Marxist, that's for sure. One thing that they really disliked was the way that the, um, uh, the Marxists, they said they were for the poor, but they didn't seem to like the poor very much or know them. Uh, so they started talking about the real solidarity with uh, the poor as they are. And uh, for example, their popular religiosity, uh, their processions. If the Marxist analysis says you don't trust the thinking of the poor because they are inhabited by the false consciousness of the ruling class. Now that's not without its truth, but it's terribly um, disrespectful of, of, of the poor people and their culture that, that you're dealing with. So they were very strong on rethinking the process of option for the poor, hermeneutical retrieval of theology, but it cannot be with Marxist categories. However innocently you slipped into using Marxist ca categories, they are cancerous. They will end up with violence and conflict. And they end up not liking anybody. You certainly don't like the rich. And you don't actually like or know the poor all that well. So it's an abstract imposition of a social program uh, that uh, is not truly emerging from an attentiveness and an understanding, a judging of truth and a responsible set of decision-making. So uh, did Pope John Paul II suppress liberation theology? Uh, do you all know that photograph, as uh, people of my generation does? Uh, he was a minister yesterday. Good, good for you. The young people are shaking their heads. <laughs> we all knew it so well in the 1970s, 1980s. Um, a priest who became a minister of government in Nicaragua, a revolutionary government uh, that uh, employed liberation theology, or exploited liberation theology, some might say, uh, to its own ends. Uh, Pope John Paul had no time for him at the airport as a, wait, as a minister of state welcoming him. Uh, uh, Cardinals, as they, he did put, go down on a knee, but the wagging finger was, uh, well, much loved by the right-wing media anyway. It, it got around the world. Um, but in, uh, about, you've probably never heard this name, I never had. Alberto Methol Ferre was a um, Latin American intellectual. He had been working with the Episcopal Conference of America, CELAM, very committed Catholic. Um, uh, he resigned from CELAM because he decided that Pope John Paul II was overdoing it. He was clamping down, in fact, on any autonomy for the bishops of Latin America at all, uh, the, and that what was needed was to let a self-correcting process unfold, by all means with you know, uh, the, the Vatican putting its, its hand on the weighing scales and favoring the Argentinian approach. This man was not um, Argentinian. He was from Uruguay, which is a very close neighbor. Uh, he believed that the Argentinian theology had the recipe for resolving the immaturities in Latin American theology, and then <coughs> for producing a future pope. His point was that the real creativity in the church after Vatican II passed through Latin America. And for all its weaknesses and und undoubted flirting with Marxism, there was something of immense value there. He died in the 1980s, so, uh, no, in the 1990s or early 2000s. He had made close friends with a young bishop that had just been appointed in Buenos Aires, Bergoglio. He went so far as to articulate this. 
We need a Latin American Pope, but not immediately after uh, Pope John Paul II. We need to recover as an Episcopal conference in Latin America. We need to recover our own voice. It's not that we go back to the liberation theology of the 1970s. We want to follow a trajectory that weaves the Argentinian approach much more into the system, but that responds to the times that we now have after the Cold War, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Things were very different, but there was a continuity of theology that, that should be uh, respected. So Methol Ferre said, we need a short lasting pontificate after John Paul II by an elderly European, and then we need a, a Latin American Pope. So he died seven years before Pope Francis was elected. But Pope Francis was, uh, Bergoglio was deeply influenced by, uh, by Mathol Ferre and never thought of himself as Pope. He was convinced he would be too old. But he, um, well, okay, excuse me, I'm not being, I'm jumping just a little bit. Bergoglio was influenced by the theology of the people. And plus Ignatian spirituality. He wasn't just a Jesuit, he was a novice master. So he brought this whole attitude of discernment into this hermeneutical approach of, of the liberation theology in general, but certainly uh, the Argentinian theology of the people. He starts to apply it as a provincial of the Jesuits and then as bishop. Uh, I don't have time to explain this, but perhaps you can all see how similar it is to what Lonergan would like. Time is greater than space. Unity prevails over conflict. Realities are more important than abstract ideas. The whole is greater than the parts. What I'm getting at is that Bergoglio became the man to organize the meeting of the Episcopal Conference of, of the Latin American Jesuits that Methol Ferre had dreamed of but had died before he ever witnessed. He, he said, this will be my final contribution uh, and I will retire because he turned 75 just after the meeting at a Parasida in 2007. A parasita begins with the, the phrase, as this Episcopal Conference has always done, this document will use the See Judge Act method of, um, of Gaudium and Spence. That is exactly what they had been prevented, ordered not to do in the time of John Paul II. The, uh, so it was this, you know, the church has always said sort of principle when you're saying something that's uh, rather innovative. Um, so a parasita. A parasita moves straight into Evangelii Gaudium. The three main encyclicals are letters of the Pope. In Evangelii Gaudium, you can find them both on the internet. Put them up beside each other in the different translations, including English. A parasita of which Bergoglio was the main author, uh, and Evangelii Gaudium. So this is the Methol Ferre vision. The Latin American Pope, representing a consensus now of the Latin American bishop, has something to offer to the universal church. So I'm suggesting that Lonergan can help. That the, um, what we're, the moment we're in is better explained by Lonergan using intellectual conversion, dialectical analysis. But the compatibilities are profound. Uh, change of epoch. Understanding the opposition to Pope Francis, you haven't been unaware of that. I would call it, remember the quotation from 1964 of, of Courtney Murray. There is a difference of horizon. That there is a difference that is so deep that it's impossible to go deeper. That's why it gets so visceral, so nasty. It's the, the class, people who have a classicist mentality feel their foundations are being undermined. They cannot see how this is anything other than heresy. So some charitable way, hopefully, to get them to accept that a widening and deepening of horizon can not just retain the objectivity of Catholic truth, but can unpack it so that it is relevant to the current situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father Will. Um, but I will talk about um, Bernard Lonergan's philosophy and theology, and also about the characteristics of um, 
Pope Francis' um, method of theology. I think it, it tell, he, tell, he told us about the, the turn of doing theology. You know, from theology from above, that means um, truth is um, um, a clear and distinct idea you know, um, in our mind. And we do our philosophy or theology you know, from above, from starting from the metaphysical principles. Uh, but now, a new turn. Bernard Lonergan um, suggests us that we can um, put a focus on historical consciousness and we can do a theology from bottom, from below. And I think it's this new turn um, not only changed the method in theology or method of theology, but also changed our understanding of doing theology. Um, I still remember the definition of theology when I um, studied theology. It's suggested by uh, St. Anselm of Canterbury, my patron saint, is that what is doing theology is faith-seeking understanding. Yeah, with faith, we seek understanding of God, of self, and of the world. But now it's not only about the understanding, it's about also the pastoral concern. Understanding God, understanding self and the world with faith. We work with Jesus Christ to build the kingdom of God on earth. So, doing theology is no longer something academic or abstract. You know, it's about um, the practice, the practices, and but what 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 are the impacts or influences of this um, the new style of pontificate of uh, Pope Francis on our local church? You know, are all these characteristics new for us and for the diocese? You know, I think um, for tonight's public lecture, the most appropriate respondent must be our Bishop Han. <laughs> Dear friends, uh, first of all, thanks to Father Vinton's um, very inspiring and enlightening uh, sharing. Huh? Uh, I have to confess that I I don't understand quite much about Longigan. Huh? I study it's not very good about Longigan. <laughs> uh, that part uh, was quite difficult for me. But when talking about Pope Francis, uh, I, I found much uh, interest. Huh? It, it, it interests me a, a lot. Huh? And uh, what I would like to share with you is about the, um, on the pastoral, pastoral level uh, of our diocese, how um, I try my best to uh, explore with you um, to my understanding how much or to what extent uh, our diocese um, uh, is try to maybe uh, not so consciously but put into practice the, the three characteristic um, um, uh, pastoral concerns of uh, Pope Francis um, in the practice. The first characteristic is discernment. I just would like to share with you how um, our diocese has uh, came to uh, the decision to um, to mark the last year, 2018, uh, to be to have this uh, pastoral focus year of youth. And um, in fact, we underwent a. Uh, Whole process of discernment. Um, as early as in the year 2015, uh, we heard about the voices that uh, youth ministry should be the focus. Um, because if you still remember well, in uh, 2014, it was the Umbrella Movement. Uh, so after that, our youth um, who were actively involved in the movement became the concern of the whole society. And then as the Uni Universal Church announced a synod on youth was to be held in 2018, the Dazas took serious consideration to establish 2017 as the year of youth. At that juncture, um, I recall that um, there were also other voices for the Dazas to consider um, protection of the environment um, or social justice uh, uh, as our pastoral focus. And then, um, an in-depth discussion was held among the members of our curia, after which the diocese consulted, as usual, the council of, um, of the priests, uh, the diocesan pastoral council, and all eight uh, deaneries of the diocese. 
And then before making the final decision, um, our late Bishop, uh, uh, His Excellency um, Bishop uh, Michael Yeo, um, uh, made an uncommon, uh, uncommon uh, but quite significant step. He asked uh, the Youth Commission, uh, the Diocesan Youth Commission, to arrange um, a meeting with a group of youth, uh, specially chosen by the uh, arranged by the commission. It is very important because with this um, concrete, direct contact with the youth, uh, uh, His Excellency, uh, the late Bishop Michael Young, uh, finally uh, decided that we have to uh, make our uh, pastoral focus on the youth and also um, come up with um, certain ways to implement uh, all uh, these pastoral themes. And I have the feeling that what the Tarsus did was somehow in line with Pope Francis' understanding of discernment. As we developed our pastoral theme for the Year of Youth in 2017, we valued much to the signs of the times, listened to the things that happen, the feelings of the people, especially the poor, and in our case, the youth. And then, let's go to the second characteristic, is uh, on the uh, inductive approach. I would like to share with you how the diocese has learned with much pain, sufferings, and uh, struggles from the ongoing anti-extradition law movement in Hong Kong. In the beginning, we did not expect, and I, and I think most of us uh, did not expect, to undergo such uh, an extended period of social unrest for over four months until now. At the early stage, when we were convinced that our public um, announcement should be made or a pastoral exhortation has to be made, then we took uh, the usual procedure, that is, we discussed among um, the members of the curia, or if necessary, we uh, find somebody, uh, expert on which area, then we ask them to give us some information, advice. And so we, in this way, we, we come up with um, a public statement to the society or, or um, uh, or a, and a kind of exhortation, a uh, letter for the, for the faithful. But then the situation uh, with the time um, goes, the situation becomes more and more complicated, as you yourself can tell. <laughs> um, resulting into um, great challenges to our ministry internally, in order to understand the challenge faced by our parishes and to reinforce the unity of the church, the diocese convoked two special meetings for all the priests and deacons working in the parishes. And then we also um, organized another meeting for all the religious on the same issue, uh, but held uh, differently. These three meetings consisted of two parts. First part, we listened to their voices, their feelings, uh, or maybe their comments uh, on what the Dazis uh, did, uh, maybe their dissatisfaction <laughs> as well. And then a sec only in the second part uh, did our Cardinal, uh, His Eminence Cardinal John Tong, uh, uh, shared with the, the attendants um, how the Dazis uh, saw or would like uh, them to do according to this or that pastoral guideline. Uh, so the first part was more important to us uh, because by listening to them, we came to know, came to know um, the real situation, what they were facing. In, parish, in the parishes. And then this is about the internal uh, 
internal uh, situation. Externally, um, in order to be in touch with the people and, and with the pores of the society, the diocesan curia met the <coughs> different camps, uh, so to speak, the pro-democracy camp and the pro-government camp, of course, separately. <laughs> <laughs> And then last Sunday, we also held a dialogue with, um, uh, with the youth, over a hundred. Uh, uh, the atmosphere was not so good. Uh, <laughs> some people said it, it, it's like uh, two planes uh, flying parallelly, parallelly. Uh, uh, not much contact, uh, not much understanding between one another. But anyway, it's the start. Uh, you know, we, older generation, uh, we, we need to, to adapt a lot, uh, to change a lot. But you know, uh, because we are advanced in age, more than the young people, so it's quite difficult for us to change. <laughs> uh, However, on, the, on, on, on their part, I find uh, at this very moment, it's also difficult for them to change, for them to listen to, to us, uh, because they are at the peak of their <laughs> emotions. Uh. So it's also difficult. Uh, I think uh, we, both of us, uh, both sides, uh, have to learn a lot. Um, and, and so, after the dialogue of last Saturday, uh, two days ago in our Kyria, we, we made the decision that we have to, we have to hold more uh, dialogue uh, with different uh, groups of young people. Uh, may not be uh, like that in, in, in last Saturday with 100, over 100 young people. It, it's difficult uh, to have deep dialogue, deep understanding. So maybe we can we can hold uh, a meetings with uh, young people, with like ten or fifteen people, uh, in a kind of in-depth uh, dialogue. So this is what we would like to do in the near future. Uh, I I think by doing so, we are also in line with the with Pope Francis, uh, uh, because we are using this inductive approach. <laughs> it takes time. Uh, it takes time and quite tiring. Not, not only tiring, uh, I, I think it is uh, an experience of um, humility. We have to be humble. <laughs> Option for the poor. Uh, this is the third uh, characteristic. It seems that uh, in recent years, um, the Diocese of Hong Kong has done quite a bit. Uh, a number of parishes have been organizing free mail gatherings for the poor in the neighborhood, I think at least for over 10 years. While some offer on a monthly basis, others um, maybe as a weekly event. Um, I know uh, there is one parish uh, offers uh, free mail uh, from Monday to Friday. Huh? So just one, one parish. Huh? And the number varies, uh, varies uh, from 30 people to 300 people. Uh, at Yao Ma uh, you know, it, it is uh, very well known, the pizza party. Uh, they, they serve every Sunday, 300 people. Some parishes organize uh, this activity, free meal um, gatherings, in collaboration with other institutes, maybe with characters uh, um, or the Society of St. Vincent de Paul, and some others uh, organize it solely um, by their own financial um, uh, and personal uh, resources. Um, but then, these kind of gatherings um, uh, do not just limit themselves on the level of, uh, on, 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 the, on the material level. level uh, I find Almost all these all of these gatherings, there is an uh, element of evangelization, like uh, um, reading, uh, singing songs, prayers, or blessing the the participants before the end of the meal. So um, 
it is also a way to um, to to make to to, to guide uh, to uh, this the, the needy, uh, not only to satisfy them on the material level, but also on the spiritual level. Yeah, if they uh, are open for this. Another example related to the issue of um, option for the poor is the increasing concerns on social justice. Um, the Catholic Church has constantly been regarded as conservative and traditional, too prudent to take steps beyond her comfort zone against social injustice in the society and against the institutionalized harm done on the poor and the marginalized. In this regard, I have to be um, uh, honest. I'm not saying that um, uh, we have changed a lot uh, or we have done a lot. What I can say is that there, there, is, there is a change uh, by uh, slowly and reluctantly. For example, on issues like um, the statutory minimum wage, standard working hours, and retire retirement protection scheme, the stand of the church was clearly voiced out. Some issues, like the minimum wage, uh, uh, has already um, liberalized. Um, on the other issues, like the uh, retirement uh, uh, protection scheme, um, and the standard of working hours, these issues, uh, we have we have to uh, go on uh, to keep our voice uh, uh, to to make our voice be heard by the government, side with the poor. And then, uh, in 2015, uh, Pope Francis issued his encyclical uh, Laudato Si. It guides the Church to comprehend the preferential option for the poor to a different level, that is, to include the rights of other living creatures. Protection of the environment has been introduced into the official teaching of the church. Two years ago in October, the Hong Kong government um, announced a, uh, a special project, namely uh, Lento Tomorrow Vision. Um, this project um, aims to, to create a, a large area, uh, a large area of land through massive, massive uh, reclam uh, uh, reclamation uh, near Lantau Island. Uh. A number of Catholic groups, together with other pro environment parties, expressed their deep concerns towards the project. We cursed the government about the, the irreversible environmental disaster that may have caused by this project. One of our arguments is the endangered living species in the concerned area. These species are considered to be the poor in this context, and the church manifests a preferential option for the poor, for them. Furthermore, I would like to point out that the role of the Catholic Church is noticeable in the recent anti-extradition law movement. While some comm commanded, uh, some, say, some said that our voice was too soft, others criticized us for being too strong. Uh, it is better to say nothing, huh? it seems. But if you say nothing, then people would criticize you uh, why you are so silent. <laughs> Nevertheless, the standpoint of the Dazas is to speak out for the weak and the poor, including those who are politically poor. As you, can, as you, as you know, it is never an easy task today. However, two, uh, ten, uh, ten days ago, um, uh, His Eminence uh, Cardinal John Tong uh, issued uh, a public uh, letter uh, to the Society of Hong Kong. I think um, most of you uh, read this letter. Um, 
and and I think this letter uh, stands for the voice of the diocese for Hong Kong at this very moment. Although still many people um, criticize uh, too strong, too strong, too soft. Uh, not much criticized on the protesters. Not much criticized on for the on the on the police. Um, however, uh, my impression, general impression, is that it is very much accepted by the majority. So, this is my response on the three um, characteristics uh, of the pontificate. Uh, Pope Francis and before I finish my sharing this evening please allow me to take this opportunity to thank Father Willem for your insightful study on the theological method of Pope Francis thank you for raising my own consciousness uh, in evaluating what is going on in our diocese uh, the extent to which it is in harmony with the central, the three central characteristics of the pontificate of Francis. It seems to me that I, I got the key uh, to understand more our Pope, and I am sure that every one of you here also have, has got the key. Huh? Okay, thank you. Now it's time for the open forum and um, Bishop Pai and Father Whedon is going to the stage, and it's um, the time for your sharing, comments, questions, and response to our guest speakers. Um, this is probably a far too intellectual, sort of very, very question. Um, the stuff about Pope Francis is far, far more important. Um, but still, since there was silence, I thought I might as well ask it. I was wondering if, uh, if our Whelan, if you could say a little bit more about the relationship between Lonergan and the sort of context of phenomenology and existentialism. I mean, you know, that word authentic, obviously, kind of is kind of flagging that up. And from the little I understand, I, uh, um, the the the, uh, the turn to the to the in, to, to the interior, which relates both to. Ignatian spirituality, but also very much to uh, to phenomenology uh, as against uh, Anglo-American philosophy of the 20th century. Things have changed a lot since then, of course. So please, if you could just say a little bit. Thank you. Thank you for your very uh, profound question. The problem is saying a little about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what can I say briefly? Uh, Lonergan believed there was this convergence of thinkers moving in this direction towards interiority, towards the third stage of meaning, some better than others. Um, the, uh, he felt that there was something of profound value in phenomenology, which he discovered relatively late in his life. So it was Newman who helped him towards uh, intellectual conversion, together with transcendental Thomists like Joseph Marischal, uh, and then through his own study of Thomas Aquinas, he wrote what are called the Verbum Articles, another masterpiece actually, uh, book length in the end. Uh, he felt though he, he could recognize in Thomas Aquinas an implicit intellectual conversion, and that if you were intellectually converted, you could realize that Thomas Aquinas who did not speak the language of interiority, who spoke a metaphysical language always, was actually getting at interior moments of insight, judgment, uh, etc. Uh, so he felt that what, what you had to do was bring Aquinas forward in the light of, well, a whole world of, of, of modern philosophy. Now, that, that's what produced insight for him. So, uh, insight was somewhat innocent of phenomenology. Uh, the, it was uh, analytical philosophy, Thomas Aquinas, his, his own reading of moderns, uh, especially Descartes and Kant. Uh, he then he moved from Canada to teach in the Gregorian uh, the, uh, in 1949, uh, uh, or 54, I think. Uh, the, um, 
54. There he starts to try to communicate his, his, his insight, book, his insights. Uh, and the students that he was dealing with had been exposed to phenomenology. So they were really good students who would come from the countries of, of, of uh, post-war uh, Europe. And he realized that he'd never get a hearing for it, so what he was trying to say if he didn't read what he called the German historicists. Yeah. So being the intellectual he was, he went quiet for 10 years and uh, uh, developed a mastery of many of these authors. He was highly admiring of Husserl, uh, uh, Heidegger, Jaspers, um, the uh, series of, of, of these, what he called the German historicists. This helped him write Method in Theology. In fact, he didn't have a fourth level of consciousness in insight. So he distinguished the level of consciousness of decision from the, uh, the, the level of judgment. His whole vocabulary changed to a Husserlian vocabulary. Levels of consciousness, authenticity, as you correctly say. That emerges after, from the 50s. He doesn't publish Method in Theology until 1972. Uh, so uh, it's the product of, of that existentialist uh, uh, shift. But just to add one important point, he said that in his opinion, while they were enormously helpful for him in, in many existential areas, they were almost all relativist. In his opinion, almost none of the German historicists, the ph phenomenologists, etc., distinguished judgment from insight. This is something he got from Aquinas and he transposed into a modern key. Thank you. Thank you. And <coughs> well, I have a question for uh, Bishop Hart. Or maybe not a question, but just a request. Um, just after listening to uh, the thousands response um, to the uh, inductive approach um, using the entire um, extradition bill as an example. So the diocese has met uh, different groups, the youth groups, um, uh, the uh, different political groups, the government, and also the uh, uh, pan democratic uh, uh, political groups. But say for, for people like me, I'm not young, I don't belong, belong to the youth group. And I don't have any political uh, say, uh, affiliations, so uh, uh, how 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 would my voice be uh, be taken care of? Well, you just make your voice heard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very glad that you are here. Uh, but, well, I more so that uh, my voice has not been. Hurt. If I may say, uh, 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 meetings that you have with the other groups. Yeah, that's true. Um, so that's why uh, on the other the other direction is not only um, the members of the curia um, to meet different groups because we are very limited. Uh, uh, so that's why we encourage we. Um, for example, today we just uh, we just uh, held the, the monthly retreat for the uh, diocesan priests. We encourage them to organize uh, different uh, meetings in in their parish or in in, uh, in whatever groups they they search. Uh, try to listen as many as, as as much as possible. So I hope you belong to one of those uh, groups uh, that you can make your voice heard. <laughs> Otherwise, you just you just come uh, to to me and uh, talk right. to me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Thank you for uh, the sharing. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty new to the theological space, uh, yeah, theolo theoretical space. But anyway, uh, I'm just curious about. Uh, the difference between the discernment and the inductive approach that you have mentioned during the talk. Uh, it seems that like the discernment and both the discernment and the inductive approach is kind of like based on previous experience or like insights and finally you make some judgment or decision during 
oh, well, maybe not decision, but it's kind of like having some reflections over the past experience. An inductive approach to me is like, sounds like having more, um, based on more uh, past experience or like experience onwards from that. But both of them sounds to me pretty similar, like it's based on experience or past observation. So and is there any difference or how might it we use discernment or inductive approach in our daily life? Thank you. <coughs> Another big question. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, the, well, I, Lonergan never used the word inductive method. In fact, in his book, Insight, he's very careful, he's in dialogue with um, the analytical philosophers and uh, he speaks of how reasoning in the sciences, first of all, he spent some chapters talking about how the mind works in the natural sciences, he points out that there's both inductive and deductive moments in scientific method. Uh, the, so it's actually very loose terminology, frankly, uh, that I have used. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's just rough uh, talking about inductive method and see judge act. Uh, it's, it's true, but it's loose. So Lonergan would prepare to talk about general empirical method. Uh, I mentioned it at the beginning, but I didn't really expand on it. Uh, so just to be careful about, about the use of the term inductive. Uh, the, now, discernment has a precise meaning within a limited realm. Uh, it, so the starting with the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, which of course builds on people like Pope Paul in the Bible, but still, it has to do with Indeed, it is, it is experiential, of course. Uh, noticing your feelings in prayer and in response to your lived activities and learning to distinguish what Ignatius calls consolation from desolation. It's subtle. It, do, it doesn't simply mean happy, happy, sad, sad. Uh, the, but what is from God, what is in tune with God in, in our affective responses and what is not, what is spiraling us away from God. It is very experiential. Uh, and the real point of Ignatian spirituality is that when you recognize you're in consolation, you can trust the decisions you make, that they will be of God. Now, uh, the Lonergan would add, but be careful to go through being attentive, being intelligent, being rational, be responsible. But you will do that if you're in consolation, and you won't do it if you're in desolation. So, uh, now, discernment then also moves to what they call group discernment, but it's basically small group discernment where people are reporting on their own prayer regarding some kind of decision. And they, it takes a lot of time, they share their movements of consolation, desolation regarding a particular decision. But there's a joke there that the, the religious superiors uh, what the, once cracked the joke to uh, conjugate the verb discern. He discerns, you discern, they discern, I decide. <laughs> so communal discernment is rather specific in Ignatian terminology and it, it is connected to a vow of obedience. So it's not parliamentary democracy, for example, it is communal discernment. And really, I prefer myself to stop using it too much. That's why I said, when we're talking about empirical method, and the dialectical method of, of studying progress, decline, and redemption. It is in tune with discernment, but only analogically so. So it's probably better to use a different vocabulary when we've moved into this theological realm. Um, could I just make a point really, but it's a kind of a question. If Lonergan has any relevance, the relevance would be if you think it is significant, reflecting on the situation in Hong Kong now, which is very lively, uh, as we know. What are the dimensions of progress, decline, redemption in the current situation in Hong Kong? Socially, politically, in the church, the protest movement. This would be the point that, that Lonergan would believe. This is the value added of taking this more academic approach that you're, you're your empirical analysis uh, is, uh, has a precision that should be fruitful. Thank you. And thank you, Father. We will use a more Ignatian way is um, to talk about what I've heard in these two days. Um, 
I think just now you talk about the sermon. I remember yesterday you tend to say that you won't talk about the sermon as the, okay. Um, I think it remind me of the what the former Irish provincial coming to Hong Kong and talk to the CLZ by saying that we use too much, too many jargons. And the sermon, though, as a word in itself, seems to have become a jargon. That we talk a lot about the sermon, but maybe we talk about making decisions. We talk about using a method to reach a decision. We talk about how to make a decision or in exercise of election. But maybe somehow in discernment, as I understand, as through prayer, as what you shared, to find out or to, to see what God really wants in this matter or in the current context in Hong Kong or in any difficult decisions that community is facing. So throughout, um, the, what, what is what God played? The role that God played in discernment? Um, that's quite one of the questions I've been asking. The second point that I heard yesterday from the response of uh, Father Stephen Dong, whom I always call Stephen, about insight as grace. I think that is um, touching. Because um, it's, it's what, what God helps us through the whole process to understand what really what God wants me or my community to engage in. So I I don't study long again. I only know the four steps from Father Sean. I use it. All right, that's my understanding. But in my reflection is that it seems long again. The four steps about experience, understanding or insight, judgment and decision, the symptoms have to come from the exam of the exercises. I'm not too sure whether my own understanding is accurate. Because in the exam, we are called to reveal our, my encounter of God during the day, the experience, come to understand the grace of God, how God is touching me, my consolation, my desolation, then move on to make a judgment and to decide what ought I do in the days following. So that is my own understanding. I'm not too sure that's accurate, but I need your enlightenment. And then the third point is uh, Bishop Ha. I have been very really touched by what Bishop Hart, you're sharing in the videos and things. Um, it affirmed me what Pope Fran Francis tell us to do, to smell the sheep. And to have, ignite, to have the discerning attitude is to, to go to the field and hear what the sheep are talking, the feelings, and how do we as adults, layperson, or people in the church respond to the needs of the people in the field. I don't know whether it's induction method or whatever method. That's what I come to try to grasp. And thanks for your sharing, interventions, and insights. Yeah, thank you for your sharing. And because of the time limit, one last question. <coughs> actually more comment than a question. Thank you very much, um, for, uh, Father uh, William, for the, for the, you, you try to, I really like the concept very much about, uh, the, the concept of, of induction. It renders everything so human. I mean, we've been talking about all these big sweeping theories and policies and all that, but something lacking is back to the basics, is induction. Um, I like your, uh, your introduction of the concept of, uh, of our experience being uh, interiority, being basic data, empirical data that we really cannot overlook. <coughs> back to the basic, back to what we are as humans. Um, so rather than going back to right now, not just only in Hong Kong, but certainly in UK and in America, everything is being reduced and boiled up into very basic, simplistic, reductive mode. 
is either this side or that side. If you're not with me, you're against me, uh, which is quite sad. So I'm glad that uh, we have this, this lecture today and render everything more human and putting flesh and blood on abstract concept. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for your sharing and comments. Um, yeah, for me, I, I learned a lot tonight, and a lot of witness sharing help us to understand, you know, um, the pastoral approach or method of theology of the pontificate Pope Francis um, from the perspective or from the uh, conceptual framework of uh, Bernard Lonergan. And Bishop Ha um, shared with us um, about how the diocese respond to, um, to the sign of time in Hong Kong and how they discern you know, um, what God's will and also how um, we react or how we respond to the challenges or you know, the, um, the requirements or the demands of, the, of not only the youth but the people but other Catholics and I, I, I learned a lot and I think um, um, you asked about the difference between the inductive approach and the discernment. Um, for me, I think the inductive approach, um, induction or deduction, is an approach to the truth, right? We just want to know, we just want to understand what, what it is. But discernment is not only about the truth, but, um, of, yeah, you may say it's true, because discernment is about God's will. We want to know God's will and help us um, to respond, to respond to His calling and to respond to, to his will. I think, um, and for my, to my understanding, I don't think um, um, the meeting with the youth, I mean the diocese, the curia meeting with the youth is not a comprehensive consultation. I believe it is, a, um, um, it is called maybe communal discernment or the discernment in common. It is a discernment of the whole Catholic community in Hong Kong. And we, we, let us pray for that. Let us pray um, for us to know God's will better and to respond to his calling better in the current situation. And once again, thank you all very much for your coming. And it's also a time for us to show our gratitude to our guest speakers. Tokens of thanks to our guest speakers. Father William. Bishop Ha, <laughs> Father Stephen Tong,